from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I am Grant Harris. I am head of the European Reading Room here. And in partnership with the Embassy of Italy here in Washington and also the Italian Cultural Institute, we are delighted to welcome friends from the Embassy and the Cultural Institute and all of you, uh, especially our very special guest, the award-winning author, Francine Siegen, who will present Italian gastronomic traditions and innovations, the historical, cultural, and economic importance of food in Italy. I would like to recognize first the wife of the Italian ambassador, Mrs. Lorda Bisogniero, and her, her two guests, uh, Mrs. Maria Serlupi Crescenzi, who is where has she gone? There she is, running back to her seat now, uh, who is in charge of educational activities at the Vatican Museum, and her husband, Mr. Alberto Ricci, head of health services for the Vatican also. Uh, I would also like to recognize a few other people who might be here. Uh, Maria Stella Gatsoulis, who is a special events coordinator at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars. Maria Eugenia Alvarez, the cultural attache at the Embassy of Guatemala, uh, a representative uh, for Angela Schweiger uh, at the cultural office of the Embassy of, of Austria. That would be uh, Ms. Evelyn Kraut, if she's here. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth M. Bowles at the Washington College of Law. She's here, thank you. Uh, Sheila Switzer, the program chair Associates of the American Foreign Service Worldwide and foreign born, foreign born Spouse State Liaison. I won't try to parse uh, all of that for you. It's, it's a great title. Uh, is she here? Okay. Uh, Deanna Femia. Is Deanna Femia here? No. Okay. Well, she uh, has spoken here also in the past, she is president of the Greater Washington, D.C. Region National Organization of Italian American Women. And we probably have a few members of that association here, so welcome to you. Also a representative from Congressman Doyle's office, uh, Marco Milarte. Uh, and, and I have to uh, now mention the, the masterminds behind this. I'm just a, a talking head, but the masterminds really are uh, Mr. Renato Miracco, the cultural attache at the Embassy of Italy uh, over here, and Lucia Wolf, who is the Italian specialist, and waving her hand back there uh, here at the Library of Congress and, and uh, has put all the words in my mouth uh, pretty much here. So, uh, Ms. Segan lives with her family in New York City, where she is active in enlightening Americans and the world on Italian gastronomic traditions and their current evolution. She does that as an acclaimed food historian, author, lecturer, and TV personality. I will not even try to list all or any of the TV shows she has been on, nor any of the newspapers and periodicals in which she has written or been cited, nor all of the cultural institutions, any of them, where she has lectured. It's a lot. Uh, I would much rather have you spend more time listening to, to Ms. Sagan. Um, what I will do, however, because uh, we are book men and book women here uh, today, and by the way, uh, many of you are sitting in the middle of the Italian reference collection. Um, uh, I will mention the delectable titles of her books. I, I really enjoy these titles. Uh, that alone is genius as far as I'm concerned. Um, I list these books because we do appreciate having a book woman here at the, at the library. So her titles, the first two are about Italian food very clearly, Pasta Moderna, New and Inspired Recipes from Italy, and Dolci, Italy's Sweets. 
but then she moves out to the rest of the world. Icons of American cooking. Entertaining from ancient Rome to the Super Bowl and encyclopedia. Opera lover's cookbook. The philosopher's kitchen. Recipes from ancient Greece and Rome for the modern cook. Movie menus. Recipes for perfect meals with your favorite films. Shakespeare's kitchen. Renaissance recipes for the contemporary cook. There are probably a few more. Uh, those are the ones I, I was told of. Uh, some of them are on display right over here, these uh, book cradles. Uh, very briefly, let me mention that the Library of Co Congress is proud of its collections from and about Italy. We have probably more than half a million volumes. Uh, we haven't given Lucia time enough to count all those volumes yet, um, but, but she's working on describing them more. She's doing a great job with that. Uh, these are books from and about Italy, mostly from Italy, with perhaps 10,000 volumes arriving each year of Italy's uh, best scholarship and literature. We are proud to have Ms. Segan's works among those collections. The, the library is open to readers six days a week, so please come and visit us. The European Division is responsible for providing reference and for developing the library's collections relating to continental Europe. We hope you have a pleasant time here today. Uh, we thank all of you for, for coming. Uh, it's now time for me to mention cell phone manners. That's all I'll say about cell phones. Please be aware that this event is being recorded uh, for the Library of Congress uh, for a webcast. So if you do ask a question later on, uh, just be aware that you, you might be uh, part of that webcast. Uh, so now please, finally, after all my talking, please help me welcome Francine Segan. <laughs> I am so honored to be here. Um, I've had a chance to say hello to some of you, and this is such a delight um, to be able to share my love of Italy. Um, as was mentioned, I've written so many books, um, which is such fun, but some of the most fun were my Italian volumes on desserts and on pasta. I also translated some books um, and just did a chapter on Italian sweets for an encyclopedia for Oxford Press. I write for different magazines. Sometimes they write about me. This is about my uh, talks on aphrodisiacs. Um, and of course, some TV, including a show I do where I interview famous people, including, for example, F. Murray Abraham, on why they love Italy. Um, and I had the honor last year of giving the gift from Italy to Mayor de Blasio, New York City's mayor, uh, and here he is raving about the wonderful truffle. So before I get started on today's talk, I'd like to wish everyone a buona festa di San Giuseppe, happy Father's Day in Italy, um, the traditional sweet that would be enjoyed today. So when I was thinking about what can I talk about today, of all the thousands and thousands of iconic dishes like pizza, all the foods, what could I narrow down? What would I mention? Could I talk and focus about all the things that come from the earth in, uh, in Italy, like the wonderful truffles, white truffles from Piemonte, black truffles from Le Marche, or olives and the long history since ancient times and the importance of olive oil balsamic vinegar, medicinal and then culinary a delight, um, or all the wonderful salumi. Things like lardo di colonata, which is this wonderful substance that's pressed between the marble, the very marble that Michelangelo went to mine uh, in Tuscany for carving the Michelangelo, that presses this wonderful substance. Other kinds of salumi, like of course prosciutto, or the uber prosciutto, the little center prosciutto, culatello. Even simple things like risotto can be elegant, or it can be a street food like arancini in Sicily. Even bread in Italy 
is marvelous. And the bread from Altamora is so special that the town of Altamora kicked out a McDonald's. There was a revolt because the panini, the sandwiches there are so fabulous because the bread is so fabulous that they were succeeded in removing McDonald's. And there was even an, um, a wonderful documentary for Kacha Blues written about that. The vegetables, the fruit, the beautiful lemons from Sorrento, the, new, the foods that came from the New World that were relatively new to Italy, but what the Italians did with them, the tomatoes from San Marzano, polenta, what they did, and chocolate, which is going to be the topic of a talk that I'm giving tomorrow at the embassy, because Italian chocolate history is extremely important. They, not only was Columbus the person who discovered chocolate and brought it to the old world, uh, but they made many, many innovations, beginning with adding something that is a very fundamental, the nuts in Italy are wonderful, uh, including the beautiful hazelnuts from Piedmont. And when their Napoleonic Wars caused a shortage of chocolate, they wanted to expand the small reserve of cocoa that they had, and so they thought, what could they mix? And they combined Piet Piedmont hazelnuts with chocolate and created a fourth chocolate flavor. In America, we know white chocolate, milk chocolate, dark chocolate. But in Europe, a very important fourth flavor is janduia, a mix of hazelnut and chocolate, which then after World War II, they made a spread um, also with hazelnuts and chocolate. Chocolate history, chocolate in Italy, once it got into Italy's hands, they made profound impacts and it was written about even at the time. So I could talk about chocolate uh, and I will tomorrow night. Now, what could I talk about on the country that invented slow food, on the country that has hundreds of DOP, DOC, IPG products? A country that Mimi Sheridan, who's a very famous New York Times, ex-New York Times restaurant critic, and the author of a book, 1,000 Things to Eat Before You Die, she talks about foods from 50, more than 50 countries. However, more than 10% of the book is dedicated to Italian foods. Americans and others love visiting Italy for experiencing the food, the people, the culture. Italian food in America is the number one most important as far as restaurants. The most restaurants in America are Italian restaurants. Wine, I could do several lectures just on wine. Um, since ancient Roman times, wine was considered to be especially help healthy, and a way for you to manage your health was to eat slowly. And the ancients used to write that by drinking wine, you would know how to pace yourself for a meal. And in fact, they used to say, a dinner without wine is a dog's meal. Uh, and this is a wine cup uh, in the Villa Giulia in, in Rome. In Italy, there's some lovely museums to look at the history of wine in Italy. One is in um, Umbria, where you'll see a collection of very interesting Renaissance glasses called Bevi Sipuo, drink if you can. These are glasses that were whimsical, that were a way to celebrate the the delight of wine. And each glass looks as if you couldn't possibly drink through the glass. Uh, in, but it was a little secret. And you had to, as the diner, you discovered what that secret was. Perhaps a little special hole at the bottom that you would sip through one of the sides. They also made jugs that looked whimsical as if you couldn't pour the wine. In Florence, right now at the Palazzo Pitti, there's a beautiful exhibit from an artist who's done lovely drawings of designs for various wine glasses and wine pitchers. Um, a food, a drink that is revered since time began. Italy has 20 regions, as you know, and I give a lecture on each region. It's called Undiscovered Italy. I do it here at the Smithsonian and other cities, so I can easily talk about just one region for the whole time that we have. 
So I decided instead I would focus today on two topics, my two topics of my last books, one on Italy's pasta and one on, on Italy's desserts. So today I'll just have to limit myself to pasta and desserts to give you just a little taste of the profound range uh, and influence Italy has had on cuisine. Uh, so now, some myths about pasta. Uh, one is that it uh, clearly was not something that Marco Polo discovered in China uh, because there are documents of factories that commercially sold pasta since 800 AD, and there's even earlier references. It's clearly an Italian food. And also you can see, although other cultures have lovely noodles, Italy has hundreds and hundreds of shapes beautiful, interesting shapes with whimsical names. So like linguini, which means little tongues, um, or ratatore, which is radiator for some of the inventions. So some of these shapes are very old, some be because of new inventions that were created in the 20s and later. So dried pasta, so many kinds. But let's focus a little bit on some of the handmade pasta. Uh, things like tortelli from Emilia and torton, so many ravioli. Some of the ones that I think are more unusual are corzetti, which are these round, beautiful discs of pasta that you press between these two gorgeous forms. And they are delicious because it has a wonderful texture on both sides so it absorbs the sauces um, and also the, the stamps are so beautiful. From the same region, Liguria, but also parts of northern Tuscany, there's testaroli. Now testaroli is a kind of pancake pasta, if you will, made on a testo, this big terracotta form, and there's a sagra. In fact, there's a sagra for every food, so, um, but there's a, a lovely sagra for testaroli, um, and then this big pancake is then cut into little rhomboloid shapes that is then tossed with whatever sauce you like. Uh, marjoram pesto is very traditional. Another shape that I love is uh, garganelli from Emilia. It has, um, you make this beautiful little square of dough, you wrap it around the rod, and then you press it against this uh, form that's called a petina, a comb, to make ridges. Um, and what I love is the kind of dog ate my homework story of the origin of this pasta. The idea is that a poor woman, a farmer, was making tortelli, the typical pasta from the area, because her husband was bringing home his boss. But as she turned to take care of the, her baby, the cat ate the ricotta filling. She had no more, he was coming very soon, so she wanted to improvise, so she had to just make the little squares more interesting since there would be no filling. And so she created this interesting, ridged, beautiful pasta. Another pasta so tiny, Cazzetti d'Angelo from Abruzzo. Teeny weeny little nibs of pasta, uh, which is often served with piselli and prosciutto, peas and prosciutto. And um, Cazzetti d'Angelo is a private part of the angel. Um, uh, another pasta, chitarra, um, a, is served with tiny, traditionally with tiny little meatballs. And kitara is made on this device, which uh, means guitar. Uh, it's this beautiful box that you roll out the pasta, then press it with the rolling pin. And what's special is that each edge, so you get a four-edged pasta, so that the surface is wonderful for having a great mouthfeel in comparison to the silky sauces. Another sauce that I, another pasta that I love is called alferetto. It's also called busiate, in, depending on what region. And basically, a pasta that, again, you take the little, little sheet and you roll it around a rod. It could be a knitting needle, anything, um, even a spoke to an umbrella. And then you pull it off um, 
a wonderful shape. Another interesting shape that sort of, I call it the Goldilocks pasta, is Incanolate from um, Puglia, which is this just beautiful curly pasta. Um, one of the ways they serve it there is with artichokes and dried prunes. A lovely, many, many uh, sauces in Italy have that kind of savory and sweet naturally. To really show the manual dexterity of the people of Sardinia, I think you can look at their beautiful baskets and also Loringhita, which is this gorgeous handmade pasta that looks like a wreath, just a little work of art. Um, the opposite end, sort of the biggest pasta, thick as your thumb, is called macaroni alla mugnaia, which um, is this pulled pasta. You start out with enough flour for a portion for, let's say, four or six people, and then it's just pulled and stretched and pulled and stretched and it becomes the serving. So you are served this wonderful dish to share. Quite lovely. A fun place to go if you like i primi, if you like pasta, risotto, polenta, is i primi d'Italia, a festival, a three day festival in Foligno, in Umbria, where the streets turn into a delight. People dress in pasta and risotto, there's fashion shows, there's tastings in beautiful courtyards. Um, chefs from all over Italy come to show wh why polenta, risotto, and pasta are so special in the hands of Italian chefs. Um, and some place that I'm very looking forward to visiting many, many times, starting May 1st until November 1st, is Expo Milano. The Milano 2015 Expo. This year, the theme of the Expo every five years, but it's feeding the planet. And there's going to be a pavilion on pasta. There's going to be a pavilion on the future of food, where you could have 3D printed food, even pasta printed. Um, there'll be a beautiful pavilion of vertical farming. It, it will really be a very special place to visit not only Italy, but to see a gorgeous, the gorgeous history of food. There'll be um, a beautiful pavilion on the history of art in food, food of the history of food in art. Um, and also there, there'll be an uh, Identita Goloso chef uh, of the week. Michelin star chefs in Italy, like uh, Massimo Bottura and Davide Scabin, every week of the 26 weeks, there'll be a different chef that will be there cooking something that will show a specialty of Italy. <laughs> now, I thought I'd take a little break from our pasta talk for a second to share some of my favorite sayings that have to do with food in Italy. In America, we say, you have rose-colored glasses. In Italy, they say, you have slices of salami on your eyes. I fette di salami sui occhi. In Italy, they say, you have salt on your pumpkin, if you're very, about somebody very smart and clever. To sop up the very last of the sauce, they say, fare la scarpetta, doing the shoe, because it leaves a little track mark in your dish when you use your bread. And then in America, we say a cherry on top. In Italy, they say like cheese on pasta. Uh, so I said I would only talk about pasta and dessert, but for a second, I have to talk about Italian cheese uh, because it goes with pasta and it goes with dessert. There are hundreds and hundreds of very important cheeses uh, and a very, very long culinary tradition of cheese in Italy. Pecorino, Caciocavallo from Sicily, the king of cheese, what they call um, Parmigiano Reggiano, uh, Mozzarella, a DOP from Campania, Burrata, which is sort of uber mozzarella. You open it and there's kind of this just creaminess inside. Um, Gorgonzola, DOP from Lombardia, that whole Po Valley has wonderful, wonderful cheeses including mascarpone, uh, which is used for many, many savory dishes, but um, the ubiquitous um, tiramisu. See how I weaved in, now transitioning to desserts? <laughs> 
So Italian desserts, so many and such a long history. Um, so many cookies um, from Cantucci. And in Italy, unlike America, where we're sort of a milk and cookies kind of country, dipping our, our cookies in milk, in Italy, it's wine, dessert wines and cookies. And there are many wonderful dessert wines to pair with, with sweets, like Vinsanto is a classic with Cantucci. Uh, every region has dozens and dozens of exceptional cookies. What I love about them, like Baci di Damma, which are little cookies with hazelnut flour and a touch of chocolate holding the two centers together, is how much the cookies of Italy celebrate the nuts of Italy. So there's always something wholesome, a protein um, that balances the, the sweetness, and they're never too sweet. One of my favorites are Peppatelli. Has anybody ever had Peppatelli? Peppatelli are a delight, four ingredients, flour, honey, almonds, and pepper, four ingredients, no eggs, no sugar, no anything else, leavening, nothing. You just mix those together, bake it, and then cut them in very thin. So it's a, it really is a very hundreds and hundreds of years old recipe because in the past, which it seems very modern now, oh, pepper in dessert, but it was very, very much, when you taste it, you realize that the honey and the nuts with that little bit of pepper has just a wonderful balance of flavors. And it was thought very healthful and also a wonderful gift to give exotic and expensive spices to guests um, after dinner. There's also the whimsical pesche dolce, this faux peach, two little halves of cookies that have a pastry cream in the middle and then are rolled in a liqueur from Italy called Alchemes, which has got about 40 different spices and was first developed in um, Tuscany. And it's delicious and it was ba it's banned in America. We can't get it. I've been lobbying myself for five years ever since I started researching it because it's a liqueur that seasons so many important desserts like zuppa inglese, yet it's banned because 180 years ago in Italy they used to put the shell of an insect to give it the red coloring. And if you drink two gallons of it, you might get a little stomach ache. And so it's banned here in America, even though for the past 70 years they have not been using that insect to color it, we still haven't accepted it here. So you have to try this when you're in Italy or bring back a little bottle. Cannoli, probably one of America's top five favorite desserts, uh, come from the name from the, the little rod, the, the cane that's used to make cannoli. And at carnival time, you'll even see gigantic cannoli to celebrate carnevale. Uh, another dessert from Sicily is cassata, a beautiful, beautiful artistic dessert. Uh, Italy also invented gelato. Uh, in Sicily, and the many, many kinds of flavors of gelato. One of my favorites is how we have breakfast in Sicily, which is gelato in a brioche. It's all your food groups. We've got, you, especially if you do pistachio ice cream, you've got the little protein and you've got the brioche. It's an egg brioche. Um, and then inventions that even in the 1950s when they made tartuffon because he ran out of a plate, a bowl to serve the dessert, they had to kind of invent this plate serving um, ice cream, to even the way to put a cartoon on an ice cream sandwich. And then sorbetto, so many wonderful flavors and so celebrating the wonderful foods, the natural foods of Italy like lemon sorbetto, almond sorbetto, coffee sorbetto. You even get your vegetable groups when you eat Italian desserts. They have many, many vegetable desserts. Now this idea of having savory sweet is something that dates to the Middle Ages um, because there wasn't such a clear demarcation between dessert course and your savory courses. Um, so for example, this wonderful dessert called torta con biscotti is a spinach pie with almond and this dates to the renaissance 
And it actually has a kind of little tie-in with Florence uh, because the name Biscari has two meanings. One is Biscari is the fret to adjust in a, in a musical instrument. Biscari, uh, Biscaro is also a fool, um, especially about money. And that second meaning came because the family Biscaro that lived, um, the Biscari family that lived in Florence didn't sell their building when they were building the Duomo. They held out for a higher price. And so the town decided to rearrange the angle and not buy their property. And so for centuries, they were known as the idiots, the fools, because they lost this wonderful opportunity to sell their property to be the ground for the Duomo. Uh, and so that got that second name. But even today, you can find, especially in the province of Lucca, you can find lots of sweets that are made with um, vegetables. You can find the torta di bis con biscari, and you can find all kinds of torta di verdura, um, and even the beautiful scapaccia, which is thinly sliced zucchini. Uh, it's amazing. We, you know, we have carrot cake, so it's, it's kind of the same idea that vegetables have a natural sweetness or, ve or some vegetables play off very nicely against the sweetness of sugar. Torta mimosa, a mimosa cake. So today is the Father's Day of Italy and just um, a few days ago, on March 8th, there was Festa della Donna, the International Day of Women. Uh, here in the States, we don't do it up quite the way that they do it in Italy. In Italy, it is really a celebration where women celebrate female friendship, and you'll see women that day with little mimosa flowers, and the mimosa became the sort of informal mascot, the flower of the holiday, because it grows in Italy at about that same time as the festival, uh, the della donna. Everybody, anyone been to an Italian wedding um, and received the confetti, the almond uh, coated in sugar? This also has a very, very, very long history, a thousand years of coating nuts and even spices in sugar. The nuts, almonds, pine nuts, other nuts, and also giving them for other occasions, not just weddings, a christening, a graduation, and depending on the color, you can go to certain sweet shops in Italy and buy the color-coordinated confetti, depending on the holiday, what you're celebrating. And these spices are very unusual and something, especially at the holiday time, that you would have after dinner, sugar-coated rosemary, sugar-coated fennel. They're um, a digestivo, the helping for a digestive, or a palate cleanser, and the way that they're made, still today you can get some beautiful um, Romanengo in Genova, uh, does still artisan, but other cities, um, Pistoia and um, in Campania also, a very ancient tradition of sugar coating where you turn the, the, whatever the ingredient is, the nuts or the spices, and trickle down some sugar uh, as it tumbles. Pan forte. Uh, strong bread is also from the Renaissance, which is a mix of many spices, dried fruit, and nuts. And this was considered to be an essential food for the winter time to keep you warm, to keep you nourished. It, they thought that all that combination of those herbs and spices and fruit and nuts were healthy um, and certainly delicious. Each holiday has its desserts. Carnevale, uh, of course, has many, many desserts, like Cenci, which has a million names, depending on what region you come from. Uh, there's little fried bits of dough, but there's fried ravioli um, that could be filled with chocolate or filled with chestnuts, many, many fried desserts. And in Italy, there's even an expression, fried, even chair legs are delicious. Coming up soon is Easter. 
Uh, and Easter has some delicious desserts as well. Uh, you wave this under an Italian, and they could be blindfolded, and 99 Italians will know what this is. Pastiera has a very distinct aroma. It's orange blossom flower water, but very fragrant, um, and it's wonderful whole grain um, and ricotta. Then Colomba, uh, a yeasty cake with little bits of candied orange. Speaking of Easter, in Panicale, there's many, many towns that have very interesting Easter traditions. In the province of Modena in Emilia, you'll find a little game that they do in many of the um, hill towns where you go into the piazza and you come with your uh, boiled egg and you crack it against another f a friend. And whoever breaks, whose ever egg breaks, has to give up their egg to the other person. It's sort of a, a wonderful competition. Uh, and in Panicale, which is a, a small little town in Umbria, known for its lace work. When you go through it, not only is there a lace museum, but you'll see all the ladies doing lace work outside. They play a game on um, Pasquetta, which is the Monday after Easter, which in Italy is an, uh, a holiday, and usually a day where families spend together and have a picnic. This town hosts a gigantic party outside where two teams of four or six men each play a game that's a very traditional game called Ruzzolone, where they take a wheel of cheese, a 10 kilo wheel of cheese, and uh, with a special cord, and it's sort of like discus. They roll this cheese through the town to see which team gets it to the to the end of the square first. Um, and then in the town square, there's a big party where there are wonderful um, pizza de Pasqua, which is a kind of, uh, not a pizza, but a bread, a round bread, a cheese bread with cheese served as sandwiches to everyone who's got, gone to the town. And then there's a gigantic chocolate egg in the town square that they open up, use a hammer and crack it, and everybody grabs pieces of, of the chocolate egg. Really fun. Uh, Christmas uh, in Italy is a delight. Um, so many things and so many sweets. Um, struffone, little fried dough balls covered in honey, dates to ancient Roman times. Uh, cartelate. Uh, cartelate is this uh, little strip of pasta that you then pinch and roll and pinch and roll to make a kind of rosette that's then fried and you serve it either with a uh, honey or with a reduced wine, um, um, a wonderful mosto. Panettone is probably the most famous Italian cake for Christmas time. Panettone is tall, yeasty, eggy, raisins, dried candied fruit. There's very strict rules about what, where the ingredients can come from and what percentages of each ingredient have to be in panettone. And what I found so interesting when I was writing Dolce, I went to visit several panettone makers. And I was amazed from the small artisan shops that made only a couple of hundred to big, big companies. The one thing that even the very, very big companies, this is a mother yeast. It's made from a natural yeast that has to be tended. They have like a little yeast nursery. Even big companies where it's kept in a basket and an employee is assigned maybe 20 of these babies where they have to turn them and nurture them for the 30 or 40 days it takes until they develop into the yeast. And this natural yeast is what makes panettone so special in the flavor, but also when you look at the ingredient list, there are no preservatives. And I couldn't believe this, so I did a test myself. I kept 10 panettone from 10 different makers in my closet because they all assured me that even in June, Six, nine months later, they promised me the panettone would be fresh. And first of all, my closet smelled fantastic. I could have rented out my apartment. Um, it, it, just from the smell, it's a realtor's delight. But it was true. Every single one maintained its softness because of that natural yeast um, and no preservatives. 
and the pairing for panettone, the traditional, is asti spumante, a little glass of asti spumante. But there's another panettone that we have the sweet one, but then there's a panettone salato, a savory panettone. Has anybody ever had panettone salato per una festa? Um, in, in several of my Italian friends, I kind of give them a job when I come. You must find for me something that I don't know here in America. And so I really have this bevy of hundreds of Italian friends that are always searching for the interesting and unusual. And this is one that uh, they do in several regions where you make the panettone. They also sell it commercially during the holidays. And this panettone is not sweet. It's like a brioche bread, but in the panettone shape. And because of that pretty dome-like shape, you slice it horizontally, and you do different layers of savory sandwich fillings. Then you cut them into little triangles. And so guests eat these little sandwiches. It's such a festive way. I have a recipe to make it at home, and I have alternates for the panettone uh, mold, too, if you, want to, if you want to try it. The other Christmas cake is pandoro. Uh, golden cake because it's very brioche like panettone but without the candied fruit inside and one of the fun things about its shape is that it lends itself so nicely to cutting it horizontally and creating this kind of Christmas tree uh, sort of shape which I love um, and you can put uh, in between the layers another classic Italian creation zabaglione and in Italy, when I went to um, I Dodici Apostoli, uh, a wonderful uh, restaurant to learn how to make some recipes because uh, it's from that area, they showed me how to make zabaglione, which is such an easy recipe. Egg and sugar in equal amounts and marsala, uh, which you use the shell of the egg. So if you use three eggs, you use three cups of the three egg shells of the marsala. Uh, and then just heat it until it's wonderful and delicious. Now, the Italians have many, many sayings about staying at the table, that you don't know someone unless you s have dinner with them, that staying at the table, you don't age. La tavola non si invecchia, which I totally believe. Uh, it's my little time machine. And in Italy, they linger over their food. They and therefore appreciate it, I think, more and eat less. Um, and each course, there's a flavor, there's a wine, there's conversation, and there is a very interesting phenomenon. If you go to an Italian restaurant and you order dessert, you've had a wonderful meal, you've had your wines, now you order dessert, and you order a cup of coffee, the way we do with our dessert here in America. In Italy, you're going to wait for the coffee and you're going to wait. And you call the waiter and you say, excuse me, a coffee, and he say, ma, ma signora, non hai finito il dolce. But you haven't finished your dessert. Because in Italy, you don't serve coffee with dessert. Dessert is served with dessert wines. And coffee is the very last thing. It would feel rude to serve you the coffee. It's almost a, a sign of the end. Um, and so they want to postpone that. Um, now, I thought that I would talk a little bit about coffee uh, to, for the end of our talk before I take questions because coffee is taken very seriously in Italy and coffee was introduced into Europe through Italy. Um, people think through uh, Veneto, but it's actually Vorno. And there's many ways that the Italians serve coffee. And there's a big debate between al vetro in a glass cup or in a cup cup. You could have it short, you could have it long, you could have a double, uh, you could have, uh, which just means the amount of water, cappuccino in the morning, but even little children know, not after 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, no cappuccino. Uh, but there's many, many ways that, that coffee is enjoyed in the morning. The coffee with a little bit, a little touch of milk marked with a little milk, or milk marked with a little coffee. Latte macchiato. There's cafe macchiato, ma latte macchiato, if you want hot milk with just that little touch of coffee. And then a wonderful, wonderful uh, tradition, cafe sospeso, which is coffee on the house. There's a tradition that it's kind of like 
pass it on, where in some coffee shops, you will pay for an extra coffee and give the ticket to the owner, so that if someone comes in, perhaps a student, perhaps a visitor who's lost a wallet, he can have a cup of coffee on the house. There are many, many, many coffee inventions. Because coffee and chocolate came into Italy at the same time, uh, and also came, chocolate first came into Italy through Piedmont, some of the places where some of these combinations of coffee and chocolate was naturally in Piemonte. Um, because before the 1600s, there was no coffee, no chocolate uh, in Europe. One of my favorites is Bicciarin. A layer who's had Bicciarin? You know what I mean. For the rest of you, let me try to do it justice. A layer of dense, dense, sweet, dark chocolate a shot of espresso, a foam, a creamy foam of cool foam on top. And so you sip the cool foam, you get to the bitter espresso, then you get the sweet thickness of the chocolate. It's wonderful. And it's always served by candlelight in this one place that's very famous for it in Torino called Cafe Bicerin. Um, another drink, combination of coffee and chocolate is uh, Cafe uh, Marocchino from Alessandria, another province, another city in uh, Piemonte. Uh, Marocchino is Mor Moroccan because it's a city that's known for its hat making. And so they call the coffee for the color of the Moroccan leather. Uh, and it's got cocoa powder in the glass uh, and then the hot coffee and then your foam and then more cocoa powder. And then in the summertime, we've got some coffee creations. The Italians, and I have to agree, coffee is a very expensive product. Good coffee, it, it, it grows in very fine places. It's roasted to the proper temperature. It's carefully ground. And for iced coffee, we leave it in the refrigerator for a week. This makes no sense. It makes no sense to the Italians. It certainly makes no sense to gourmets. The volatile oils get ruined. It's not the way to have iced coffee. The way to have iced coffee is the way the Italians do shakerato, which is in a shaker. You put ice, you put a shot of espresso into the ice, and you shake it until the, it's cold, and then you strain it into a glass. And so you still get some of the crema, and that's a fabulous way to have um, iced coffee. Another way, more in the south of Italy, is Café alla Salentina, which is cold espresso, uh, so espresso, but then hot espresso poured over ice so it becomes cold, and then with a, a lovely touch of almond milk. It's a kind of almond syrup that's a specialty because the almonds are so wonderful in that part of the country. There are cocktails, too, for the wintertime when it's cold. Um, uh, galeggiante is, it means to float, and it's a lovely drink because it, it ha has three layers. One layer is a mix of some, several kinds of liqueurs that were heated up in the, in the foamer, and then a little bit in few, you, you then take the, um, a little piece of lemon and then gently pour on top the espresso so it floats over the liqueurs, and then you give it a little aroma of bay leaf. Um, and the third layer is just the crema that just naturally comes to the top. So it's really a very, very special, um, delicious drink in the wintertime. And then uh, Café a la Valdostana from the north in this wonderful cup called La Grola o La Copa de Amicizia. So it's this beautiful round wooden coffee cup that's called a cup of friendship. You put in, they generally put in hot coffee, but then they use these wonderful alpine liqueur that there's sugar that's burned onto every spout. And the idea is that you take this hot drink at the end of your meal and you share it with everyone at the table. And you cover two holes and you drink from one, you pass it to the next person, they drink from a different hole, there's liquor, so it's, it's sanitary. Uh, and so there's this wonderful friendship, this sharing, something that those similar kinds of gestures were done in ancient Roman times. Uh, so I think that that's um, a very nice place, this 
friendship coffee for me to pause to take some questions because I've tried to give us a little taste of some of the foods that I love and some of the food customs from pasta to dessert cheeses but there's so much more uh, and so many festivals and so many cities that honor and have interesting traditions to visit so now I'll take a, a break so we can think about some questions that yes The, the, question, uh, the question is, how do I stay so slim when I um, have all these wonderful visits to Italy? And it's actually in Italy that I get slimmer um, because I find that the portions are so proper when you go to a restaurant that the food is so flavorful that with a little you're satisfied. It's amazing how many bad habits I think that we've gotten to, or at least where I live in New York City, um, that I don't see as much in Italy. And I think that a couple of, of things that I love to take home from Italy, one is not, there is no coffee holder in an Italian car. They do not drink coffee while they're driving. Uh, there is no walking around the street eating french fries uh, or chips from a bag. You sit down to eat. Uh, or you stand at the counter at a bar when you're having your coffee or a quick lunch. But you basically set out your time, even if it's just 10 minutes, you very rarely will find an Italian doing eating and something else beside talking. It is just makes you such more conscious of food and enjoying it. The other is the portions. When I, I, I usually spend six weeks in Italy with my children, and especially when they were little, six weeks is like a whole life to a four-year-old. So my son would come back, he would forget America, we would get off the plane, we'd go, the kitchen was empty, so we'd go to a restaurant near where we lived. And I'll never forget the first time the waiter put down a dish in front of my son. He ordered, coming back from Italy from six weeks, what did he crave? pasta. Uh, so he ordered a pasta dish. They put it in front of him. He's four years old. He picked it up and put it in the center of the table because he thought the portion was for all of us. A, a buffet in Italy. There's something called a pericena or aperitif lungo. Now, especially in the north, it's kind of chic that in the evening, instead of a sit-down dinner, a traditional, many bars will have a buffet. And there'll be all sorts of foods that will be put out. And you, for the price of a glass of wine or an aperitivo, you can help yourself to the buffet. And it's amazing they put out very high quality food because Italians take a little small plate and put a little bit on the plate. I've been to Florida. I've been to the early dinners. I've been to Las Vegas buffet. And the mountain that we put on our plates, I, it's amazing. Uh, in Italy, they would rather give you another plate, uh, to have a clean plate so that you can enjoy your experience and taste each thing. And so that's why I think that traveling in Italy is like living in a spa. Yes? Um, where do you, uh, you explain the anatomy? Because I took this anatomy from Milano and Milano uh, and Milano. Where do you explain the anatomy of the So I was thinking that this is a very serious preservative. So what you said was that there are these naturalists that you can crush. So why isn't that used more widely in our embrace? And so it doesn't go stale. The question is, as I mentioned for Panettone, and the gentleman concurs, the panettone doesn't go stale, but yet when you look at the ingredients, there are no preservatives. So, since it's so simple, why don't we all do that and avoid the preservatives? Because it's extremely labor intensive and you really have to care. To just name one company that's a very big company, Baoli, I went to visit them and they, one worker explained to me that there was a fire and the person ran in and out to take her basket of her 20 babies, because you really have to take care of these yeast, these babies that grow in this little bassinet. So it's labor intensive, unfortunately, to keep costs down, or because perhaps they think the American consumer won't notice it on the palate, it's easier to just put in a chemical leavening. Um, it's faster, you don't have to wait. Um, it takes 40 days to do that mother leavening. That's 
that means you have to have a dedicated room. It's seven day a week employees that take care of it. So the simple things, the things that there are, there are people whose grandmother passed down a mother leavening. Has anybody had um, a mother yeast passed down from an aunt or a grandmother that you keep adding flour, keep adding water, and you can keep this thing going, but you have to take it with you on vacation. Um, so it's, it's simple because it's the natural, real way that we should be eating, but it's complicated too because it is labor intensive. No, and I wish more people did it. And that's part of why Italian bread is so good. And you can tell good bread when you slice it and you look at the holes and they're irregular. Some of them are big, some little. Bread should not look like a sheet of paper. Yes. There's an excellent point she's mentioning two dishes, um, both con vongole with clams. And a lot of people come back from Italy and they say, this was so good, I'm gonna make it. I talked to the chef and I'm gonna make it here. And it doesn't come out. So you think that maybe the chef didn't tell you all the ingredients or how to make it, which even an Italian grandmother won't tell you always every secret. Um, but this is one of the reasons why I think that to really understand Italian cuisine, you must travel in Italy. There are some foods that are so local, they don't even have enough. Even if you promise you'll give them a thousand dollars, they don't have enough to sell to you. They only have it for their very small area because it's very small production. If they tried to kick up the production, it would ruin the quality. And so that's why I think that you must visit Italy to really taste some of these dishes in the place because canned tomatoes, they're good, but the fresh there, the, even the basil, even the way that they'll grow some herbs, I taste a huge difference. Silly things, capers, um, which by the way, don't buy capers in, in vinegar. It's like a preserved thing from a high school biology class with salt. Uh, so it pres preserves the flavor. But it's the ingredients, it's the water that they use to even boil it, and then it's the hand, the cook's hand. They know how to play with the fire, they know how to raise the heat, lower the heat. Even the clams, they're special from local waters, very, very difficult to duplicate. Um, but if you email me, I'll try to ask the chef what his secrets are and see if we can't get it a little closer. Yes. The difference between gelato and ice cream. Uh, gelato is not kept as cold. So it, that's one big, big difference. And the other is it's uh, more difference between an egg custard, adding egg and, and the amount of whipping it. So Italian gelato is not as whipped, it's not as airy, so it's denser. That's why it's so uh, rich tasting. It's not as air filled. And also, if you notice how soft it is when they serve it to you, you have to eat it kind of quickly. Um, the ice cream here, you could get like a tall, tall cone and it doesn't melt. There, it, it's softer. And I like that idea of lowering your freezer temperature so that if you get gel good gelato uh, or you make gelato, you lower the, your own freezer temperature so it's not as cold. There are so many, yes. A, a cafe granita, and then you could have it with um, uh, whipped cream on top, panna. That's, the, the coffee granita is wonderful and so simple to make. Good coffee in the freezer, and then you could just fork, um, uh, break it up. Really lovely.
So what, uh, the question is, what about gluten-free in Italy? There are definitely celiac, people who suffer from celiac, who suffer when they eat gluten products. And in Italy, I found my daughter is celiac, and they're very, very attentive. There are pizza places that will have a certain area, because even the, the smallest little bit of flour, uh, and so they have gluten-free flours. In Italy, if you prove that you're celiac, um, and you can get a prescription from your doctor, and in health, and like a pharmacy, you buy, you will get gluten-free products. So Italy, because of this awareness that it is a medical condition that needs to be taken seriously, it's not a diet fad from a TV star or a movie star. It is an illness. They help to provide these really wholesome gluten-free foods. So you get crackers and pasta that is subsidized so people can go and this causes the Italian companies to do research because they know that they will be able to sell this product with the help as if it's a prescription of medicine. And they produce some of the best gluten-free products. I think there's some wonderful gluten-free pasta where it's a combination of several grains, quinoa, rice, keeps it al dente, breads. So I really like the imported gluten-free. Uh, and it isn't so much a craze just um, for dieting, but an actual uh, for people who have an, an illness. And you don't see as many of these diet crazes like the paleo diet. Has everybody heard about that here in America? I don't hear that many of those kind of crazes in Italy. I think they know that they really own the Mediterranean diet. Yes. The slow food movement housed in Piemonte, started in Piedmont, is the idea of the opposite of fast food. Started as just a very simple concept that took off worldwide. And there are restaurants that have uh, signed on as slow food restaurants that the people that endorse these restaurants go to visit and are very, very careful about it. There are chapters here in the United States. It's an international, now become an international craze um, because people value the idea that slow food means it will take you a little bit. You need to sit in the restaurant, have a little glass of wine, and relax and wait for your food to be properly prepared and served. Um, Yes. <laughs> a political aspect to slow food. I don't do politics. My advice on olive oil, what I do, is I purchase very, very high quality olive oil and I look for DOP on the label and you can go to a good store and you'll see that. And then I never cook that olive oil. I do what I see so many Italian chefs and Italian homemakers and bloggers do. If I'm doing verdura lesse, if I steam my vegetables and I put them out in a platter warm and I put the olive oil and you put the fresh olive oil on, you'll taste the olive oil. When I do my pasta, I'll put it on at the end. So I use it more raw for very, very good olive oil. Not so much cooking with it. I think you ruin some of the wonderful flavor of it. And I agree, some of the health benefits. Is my time up? Thank you so much. It was such a delight sharing a little taste of Italy with you all. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.